Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Airplane Anatomy. In this series, I break down different airplanes from their history to their engineering to how they fly. So today in episode 12, we're going to be talking about one of the first generation spy planes. She's the grandmother of the SR-71 Blackbird, and that is the U-2 Dragon Lady. Now to a lot of you out there, the U-2 is notorious for being one of the most difficult planes to fly. In fact, it even requires a chase car to help it land. But it's a little lesser known Known that the U-2 actually single-handedly changed the course of history, being the only aircraft that both started and ended the Cuban Missile Crisis and eventually the Cold War. So it might surprise you to find that this incredible aircraft that was designed back in the 50s is actually still in service today. But at the time of its creation, its designs were so out of the box that the Air Force actually refused to fund the program and the CIA had to step in instead. So there is definitely a lot more than meets the eye to the U2 Dragon Lady, and we're going to unpack all of that in this episode, so stay tuned. The time was 1950. The US had just come out of World War II a few years prior, but was actually around the corner from another conflict, as tensions were escalating with the Soviet Union. So following the attacks of Pearl Harbor, the US knew that they needed new surveillance airplanes to spy on their enemies. They wanted to make sure that the same thing never happened again in the future. Now, the airplanes that they had at that time for this task were repurposed World War II bombers, like the Boeing RB-47. So these were huge, loud, and slow-flying bombers that were serving as spy airplanes that were real subtle. So to build this newest and greatest reconnaissance aircraft, the biggest challenge was that it needed to fly higher than any aircraft had ever before. In fact, it needed to fly higher than most radar and missile systems in existence at that time. The magic number the US government determined was going to be 70,000 feet. So just to give you a perspective of how high that is, that was around double that of the service ceiling of almost every other airplane in existence during the 40s. And even modern airliners today have a service ceiling of around 40 40,000 feet. So at that time, asking for 70,000 feet to aircraft manufacturers was the equivalent of asking for the impossible. But this challenge did catch the attention of an engineer at Lockheed by the name of Clarence Kelly Johnson. Now, if you're an aviation geek like me, you've definitely heard the legend of Kelly Johnson before. He was a leading engineer at Lockheed that was responsible for designing many of its iconic aircrafts, like the SR-71 Blackbird, the P-38 Lightning, and of course, the U-2 Dragon Lady. So he came up with a pretty unique looking design for the U-2 that promised to reach an altitude of 70,000 feet, but the Air Force wasn't impressed. Air Force General Curtis LeMay actually walked out halfway through this presentation meeting with Lockheed saying this plane just isn't going to work. Now they went on to collaborate with a British aerospace manufacturer that actually produced the highest flying plane at that time called the English Electric Canberra. They wanted to see if they could make an improved version of this plane for the US military. But Kelly Johnson's designs did catch the attention of the Central Intelligence Agency, who coincidentally also had an interest in espionage. In fact, the CIA loved the plane so much, they went on to convince President Eisenhower that they should be the ones in charge of running these espionage missions, as opposed to the Air Force, since they were less likely to provoke a war. That was their reasoning, and President Eisenhower actually agreed. So in 1954, for the very first time, the CIA and the US Air Force collapsed collaborated in this project to develop a brand new reconnaissance aircraft. So what exactly were these groundbreaking designs that were so out of the box the Air Force refused to even entertain them? Well, Kelly Johnson decided to basically strap a very powerful single J57 engine to a glider with very long and thin wings. Now, every pound was so crucial on this aircraft that initially it didn't even have landing wheels. Instead, it was supposed to take off from a very special cart and land on its belly, but eventually this was switched for very small landing gears. And eventually the prototype was actually able to 
to fly up to 73,000 feet. However, these designs to maximize altitude also came at some pretty serious consequences. For one, the wings actually created so much lift that they were incredibly difficult to land, especially on days with even the slightest crosswind. They had this tendency to drift right over the entire runway. So in order to stay on the ground, pilots actually had to completely stall the aircraft at around two feet off the ground. Any higher and the landing gear will be damaged, and any lower, the plane won't be able to stop in time. So to achieve this extreme level of precision, U2s actually require a chase car to drive just under the plane as it lands, basically talking the pilot through the landing and also giving the plane's altitude. The U2 also had auxiliary wheels called pogos that were attached beneath each wing and would help with balance during taxi and takeoff. So these wheels would actually fall off during takeoff and be reattached right after landing. And the Dragon Lady wasn't any nicer in the air either. Since the plane itself was optimized for flights at extremely high altitudes, which require very tiny inputs for movements, at lower altitudes, this meant that the pilots didn't have any power-assisted controls, and the plane itself required a huge amount of physical effort to fly. There was no such thing as fly-by-wire back then. And at 73,000 feet, the plane is flying at an extremely slim margin between the stall speed and the maximum speed. So fly any faster and the physical forces on the aircraft will actually tear it apart. And any slower, the plane will stall and enter into a nosedive. And at times, the difference between these two speeds were just 10 knots. So this is also known as coffin corner and of course requires a tremendous amount of concentration and effort from the pilot to fly. The plane also flew to such extreme altitudes so quickly that over the years, over 70% of U2 pilots have experienced decompression sickness, which happens when a rapid change in air pressure causes nitrogen bubbles to form in our blood. Now, in mild cases, this can lead to fatigue and muscle and joint pain, but in more severe cases, decompression sickness have actually impaired brain function and even led to permanent brain damage, which was unfortunately the case for at least nine U2 pilots. So to help with this, U2 pilots breathe an hour of pure oxygen prior to every mission and also wear high pressure suits similar to spacesuits. Now just to continue the sci-fi theme of the U-2, I've also read some sources that say U-2 pilots are offered a suicide pill before every mission. Now these pills called L-pills contain potassium cyanide and can cause death within 15 seconds of consumption. But at one point, a U-2 pilot almost accidentally took the L-pill, mistaking it for candy. And at the same time, the Air Force discovered that if one of these pills broke during flights, that it would also kill the pilot as well. So eventually, this was reportedly replaced using a neurotoxin-containing needle that was hidden inside of a silver coin, and that coin was offered to pilots before every flight. So I'm not sure if that's still the case, but that's definitely some sci-fi shit right there. The U-2 took its accidental maiden flight in 1955. So why accidental, you might ask? Well, the pilot had no intention to actually fly the thing. It was supposed to be a high-speed taxi test, but the wings just generated so much lift that it lifted off the ground. Show off. Now, as you can imagine, the production and testing of this plane took place in absolute secrecy. So despite being a reconnaissance aircraft, which are typically given the designation R, the US very understandably wanted to keep this new aircraft under wraps, so instead gave it a U designation for utility. Now, if you're curious, like I was, the U-1 plane was an actual utility aircraft that was made by de Havilland Canada, so this new aircraft was given the name U-2. And during testing, since these airplanes couldn't be flown out of the local airport at Burbank, California, where Lockheed was located, they were actually tested out of the grounds of Area 51. And also during that time, altimeters only went up to 45,000 feet. So to order this new equipment that was calibrated at up to 80,000 feet, the CIA actually came up with a cover story involving a new rocket aircraft. Specifically for the U-2, Shell Oil actually had to come up with a brand new jet fuel that wouldn't evaporate at such high altitudes. This ended up costing three times as much per gallon than the conventional jet fuel. So everything about the U-2 had to be unique, but very soon it proved that it was worth the trouble. 
By the late 50s, several U-2s began to enter service with the CIA, performing aerial reconnaissance missions, taking pictures of different countries. To the public, the CIA said that these planes were for gathering weather information. These flights, which were technically breaches of foreign airspace, were called overflights, and initially the CIA was so confident in the U-2s that they assumed U-2s flew so high they couldn't be tracked on radar, or at least they couldn't be shot down by surface-to-air missiles. And so for this reason, the Air Force, despite being initially pretty skeptical, actually ended up liking the U-2 so much they purchased 31 U-2s from the CIA, and even began testing them on aircraft carriers. But by the 60s, the U-2 was actually starting to lose its edge as countries were now catching up in the radar technology and also developed missiles that were capable of reaching the aircraft. But the US still continued to operate their overflights because they have simply gotten away with it for so long. Of course, their luck eventually caught up to them during a U-2 flight on May 1st of 1960. Now in hindsight, this turned out to be a very bad day for a U-2 mission to begin with since it was a federal holiday in Soviet Union and hence there was reduced air traffic. But on this day, as a U-2 entered Soviet airspace, it was being tracked on a radar, and eventually two surface-to-air missiles were shot at the aircraft. Now they actually detonated close enough to the aircraft to cause it to crash, but the pilot and the majority of the airframe actually survived. But at that time, the US believed that a crash from 70,000 feet was not survivable, so they decided to stick to their cover story of a weather aircraft getting lost and drifting into Soviet airspace. It was only a few days later that the Soviet Union revealed that the pilot, Gary Powers, was actually still alive and had confessed to his missions. So this then forced the US to admit the existence of the U-2 espionage program to the public for the very first time. So following this incident, the US decided to stop all overflights over the Soviet Union, but continued their operation in the rest of the world, including Cuba. In October 1962, a U-2 captured photographic evidence of Soviet nuclear missiles at a secret launch site in Cuba, just 90 miles away from Florida's coast. As a result, President Kennedy ordered a naval blockade of Cuba and demanded that all weapons be sent back to the Soviet Union, sparking the Cuban Missile Crisis. And just over a week into this very tense period, on October 27, 1962, a U-2 flying over Cuba was detected on Soviet radar, and eventually it was shot down using three surface-to-air missiles, killing the pilots. Now, this resulted in what many people interpret to be the tensest moment of the Cold War, as many of the president's advisors and also his military personnel advised him that this escalation was an act of war, and that the US should respond using nuclear weapons. Thankfully, it had the very opposite effect. It became a wake-up call to both leaders of the US and the Soviet Union that this conflict was spiraling out of their control, and hence, on the night that the U-2 was shot down, the US and Soviet Union Union reached a secret deal to peacefully resolve the standoff, and hence marking the beginning of the end of the Cold War. So fortunately and unfortunately, the captain of that U-2 plane, Captain Rudolf Anderson Jr., ended up being the single casualty of the Cold War, potentially saving the lives of millions. Of course, with the development of technology and also the rise of unmanned surveillance aircrafts, the U-2 is slowly beginning to lose its edge, especially with its limited speed and also high operating cost. Now, there's been talks of retiring the U-2 as far back as 2011, but the U.S. continued to reverse that decision several times throughout the next decade, since they still believe that some functionalities of the U-2 still couldn't be fully replaced. Stiff snap, stiff snap, stiff snap! This was further supported by Lockheed Martin as they recently determined that the current aircrafts have only used around a fifth of its designed surface life. So as of yet, the aircrafts are still in service and the Air Force has plans to fund it until at least 2025. There's also been rumors that the U-2 might be replaced by the unmanned vehicle RQ-4, which is still undergoing renovations. And back in 2014, Lockheed Martin actually came up with a design for an unmanned version of the U-2 that hasn't really drawn a lot of traction. So, so far it's looking like we can expect to see the U-2 in the skies for at least a couple more more years, except we won't be seeing anything. So there you have it, everything you need to know about the U-2 Dragon Lady. Now I say this in every single episode, but I really enjoyed reading about the U-2 and it's so interesting hearing about all of the stories and the historical anecdotes. And I just think it's such an interesting claim that not a lot of people talk about. So I'm really happy to have shared this episode with you guys. Now, if you have any suggestions for future airplanes I should cover in Airplane Anatomy, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And as always, if you enjoyed 
enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to my channel for new content. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Achieve this extreme level of precision, precision, but of course, eventually their luck caught up to them. Cut up, cut up, caught up. Uh.